All right, I'm at a place called Black Lake Club here in the Maripaw Swamp. Look, see the sign up here, right there. My good buddy C-Mac, Chris Macaluso is coming to meet me. We're gonna explore this area, see what we can find. There's talk of putting a diversion in this area to improve the fishing. I've never fished in here, not that I can recall ever, but we're gonna see what we can catch today. We're gonna be targeting brim, sockele, bass, whatever, whatever will bite, maybe even some catfish. I know C-Mac is bringing some jugs. We're gonna put those out and try and catch the cats. So we'll see, we're just gonna have a fun day exploring the Louisiana swamp. Come along with us. All right, C-Mac and I are on site. This place is beautiful. Look at this. First order of business is to get these catfish lines ready. C-Mac brought some jug lines. What you got for bait? Sackle bellies. Sackle parts. That's the bait. So we're just going to put these out right here in this little, we're kind of this little offshoot here of the main drag. It's about four feet right here in the middle. We don't really know what we're doing. Maybe we'll put some out here, and maybe some in the in the big part of the bayou, the deeper part, and see if one's better than the other. We're going to let those set while we fish, though. Oh, man, you got multiple hooks per, huh? Yeah. Well, should we, should I, I do this up right, but should I start the big motor and we'll just put along or no, I'll just troll the motor's fine. Troll? Just okay. Just kind of go along this edge. All right. Um, All right. Well, C-Mac gets these jug lines ready. I'm going to throw this ATV crankbait, Bill Lewis product. It's a smaller crankbait. Doesn't dive very much at all. Really like this bait. Caught a lot of fish on it. Speckled trout, redfish, and of course, bass. This water is gorgeous. As long as it's got some. Don't know if it holds fish, you know what I mean? Yeah, as long as it's got some oxygen in it. It, it kind of looks a little hypoxic. Thus, the need for a diversion. Yep. Sounds like a damn monkey. Sounds like a monkey. You hear it? Yeah. I don't know what kind of animal that is. I'm guessing a bird, but none I've ever run across. Well, there we go. Look at you. There you go, buddy. See, Mac, we won't get skunked. Nice little fish, man. Yep. Not what you would catch on a Jafunta. Yeah, look how dark. Yeah. <laughs> this it's pretty black, water. Black water. ATV crankbait. He hit when it hit the water. I bet you could throw a pop bar and yeah. catch him. But still, it's, it's obscene. Yeah. Oh! <laughs> Man, did he tag it? <laughs> oh, goodness. This fish is not big, but man, that was a crazy hard hit. It almost looked like a goggle eye so dark. There you go, dude. There's some kind of bird up in that tree. There's no lack of bird life around here. Owls, Mexican squealer ducks, and wood ducks, and you name it. I am keeping fish, but I'm not keeping that fish. I do have some standards. So if anybody can identify that bird just based on the call, let me know what it is. I can't find it in that tree, but he is going crazy. Somebody will know what it is. Probably got a nest. You want to hit the brim? You want to try that? You want to? Uh, yeah, I got a little jig tied on here. I think I'm just gonna kind of flip it. Uh, okay. Well, I guess I'll keep throwing this. See if you get bit. Are you serious? 
<laughs> Dude, look at that. Look at that pretty little, I don't know what he is, a little bluegill, female. Well, that didn't take long. First cast. Maripaw Swamp, the land of the small fish. It's a small sample size, but <laughs> based on what we've caught, <laughs> they're small. But you get to fish in this setting. Look at this place. Just gorgeous, particularly in the spring. Oh, there we go. I got a bluegill, I think. Yep, a nice one. There we go. <laughs> Where was that one at? Yeah, he was out a little bit, right over here. Oh, man, look, look at that. Oh, C-Mac, nice already? Yeah, look. Dude, that's oh, a nice oh, one. Huh? There we go. All right. A couple of pretty Look at brown. this. We gonna be, them out, Todd. We're going to be eating. C-Mac and I were wondering how much life would be in this area just because this water is so dark. It's kind of got that hypoxic look. When water gets back in the swamp, there's so much detritus on the bottom that it decays, and when the water pulls out, it just doesn't have any oxygen in it, or not much oxygen. And so sometimes you can find this really, really dark, beautiful water, and it's just completely devoid of fish. Obviously, that's not the case here. We've gotten lots of bites. We haven't been fishing long at all. All this is public land, too. Yeah, it's all part of Marpaw Swamp WMA, huh? Yeah. Dude, you see those irises up there? Those are irises, huh? Yeah. Beautiful. Beautiful. See this little area right here? Just looks so good. Dude, Dude that looks right, good. Gotta be a flip bed. Right. Gotta up in there. Just looks so good. I really love this style of fish, and I always say it every time I do it. Like, I don't do it a lot because, like, you're always chasing saltwater fish, but I really love this. It's gotten to the point, really, where this is what I'd rather do. Yeah. I would rather come in here and bass fish a little bit and throw a little popping cork and catch some sackle or catch some goggle eye. Right. It's just so much less stress. It is. Than loading the boat up and going to Grand Isle and having to deal with all that. Plus, you can fish. If it's blowing 20, you can fish. Yeah, no doubt. You could fish. Well, you, you wouldn't even know it if it was blowing yeah. 20. So you can make a whole day out of fishing this spot. You know, whereas when you go to the coast, it's, and there's just so much pressure now, and there's so many people. And yes. There's so few people who are courteous about it. <laughs> right, right. You know, there's so little marsh left in some of these places. I mean, Grand Isle. You know, everybody's fishing the same 15 structures right. all the time now. Yeah, you got tw 20 boats on anything that has fish. You pull up behind Grand Terre now, and there's a boat every 50 yards, as far as you can see. Right. You know, because it's the only place people know how to get to anymore. It's the only place that's kind of protected from the south wind. I mean, I don't feel like dealing with that anymore. Right. I mean, we could fish in here all day and, and not have another boat in here. Right. Winter. Yep. This is how the basin used to be, you know what I mean? Like, and this is this is the first spot we stopped to fish. Like this is and we we're found we found fish already. I gotta throw I gotta throw that slab hunter minnow just to see if we can catch a sock. There might be some. Yeah. Why would there not be? Got him? Yeah. It looks like a, a oh, decent fish, no? He's big enough to keep. Throw him in the box, see, Mac. We're in mercenary mode today. Oh, there you go, see, Mac. Cardos, you know. That's a nice one. Yeah. Dude, that's a good fish. That's cool. Dude, that's awesome, man. I'm impressed with Black Lake. I got some more. Yeah, I mean, I got a, I got a cork right here. I got. I'm just trying to catch a soccer leg on this slab hunter minnow. All right, let's see. Let me throw a cork a minute. How deep you fishing, Bry? Oh, maybe 18 inches. Oh, that's it. Okay, I got to lower mine then. Man, you won't be but 10 minutes. Oh, there we go. That didn't take long. That's a big one, man. That's a nice fish. Goggle eye. Goggle eye. There we go. All right. All kind of variety. We got us a double. Nice one. Nice brim. 
All right. Dude, look at that brim. Look how dark Yeah, beautiful. I'm gonna throw it right in your spot. Oh, that didn't take long. I done missed him. Which, you throwing a 132nd? Uh, 148. Really? Even lighter than that. Huh? Water temp is 72. Perfect. Yep. Dude, this place is stunning, man. This is, like, look at this scene. This is beautiful. Like, this is classic Louisiana. You got another one of those tiny little micro jigs? This, I think, is too big. Some heads too? No, this I, this is one thirty second. It's fine. I'm comfortable with this. It's a good one. Oh yeah, there you go. So, see, Mac, you've done a lot of pan fishing in the Louisiana swamp. What would you say are some of the keys? Well, I think it depends on what time of year it is. In the springtime, obviously, the brim and the chinka pin and even the sacolate to a certain extent, although we're getting a little late on the sacolate, they're going to want to be up shallow. And during the spring, I find you don't necessarily have to target cypress trees or gum trees or trees that are in the water, that kind of stuff. Where they're going to mainly be is around the vegetation. You know, when they want to build a bed, they want that bed to get sunlight. And so they're going to be kind of in an open area like that. See, kind of behind one set of lilies and in the middle of another set of lilies. And you may fish five spots that look like that, and the fifth one's just going to have 70 fish in it. You know, obviously you can get 200 crickets and come in here and figure them out. But just like we did this morning with these little jigs, search, 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 and then when you find them, you can sit in that one spot. And if they turn off the jig, you know the fish are still there. You put the crickets on or the worms and you can sit there and keep at them. Beetle spins are a good option, although if you're kind of a novice fisherman, you're gonna have a little trouble navigating the vegetation. As you move more into the summer, those fish are gonna either pull off a little bit deeper or they're gonna get in the shade of these cypress trees. They're gonna get up in those knees. And, and if you wanna look for saccolate during the summertime in these areas, what you wanna do is find a canal that's got, or a, a bayou that's got eight or 10 feet of water in it and look for trees that are sticking out towards the middle of the bayou or junk that's in the middle of those canals or bayou and fish that. Some of the biggest sackle that I've ever caught in the Chafalaya Basin have been in the middle of the summer on stuff that looks like isolated junk in the middle of a canal, but it's really just an old treetop or a sunken log or something and it's got fish sitting on it. They're gonna find the deepest, shadiest, coolest water they can find. Another thing that's really cool about these places is the goggle eye. Goggle eye are so much fun to catch. And you can catch them on little brush hogs or little creature baits and stuff like that, like you bass fishing around the cypress trees. Or you can just take little crawfish looking jigs, fish them 18 inches under a cork and flip around all of these cypress and lilies. And generally in May, June, July, so you can catch the heck out of those goggle eyes. And what about chinkapin? How how do they behave differently than say a typical bluegill or or even a goggle eye? So chinkapin like hard bottoms. You know they like areas where there are shell beds or hard bottoms. And usually when you've got lilies like this growing, it's an indication that the bottom is is a little bit harder. And those fish will gang up on those areas. You know sometimes chinkapin will, will spawn out on points you know with just a little bit of vegetation around it or maybe there's a stump in about two feet or three feet of water sitting out on the edge of a point and those chinkapin will be all around that stump spawning now if you were targeting them what would you throw oh i would throw night crawlers night crawlers okay you know and a lot of guys who fish them fish them on a drop shot you know they'll just go along these areas and just drop it into those holes until they find them so they don't want even fish a cork. And in some of those, like the oxbow areas and stuff that have the old shell beds in them, that's the way a lot of guys fish them, is they'll fish like a little quarter ounce or three eighths ounce bell sinker with a, with a hook and a big old chunk of night crawler on it and just bounce around till you find that hard bottom. And then usually those chinkapin will be there. And they'll start spawning, you know, from now until probably the mid to end of May. But you want to look for areas that give you an indication that the bottom's a little bit harder. 
and that would be lilies or areas where you see clamshells and that kind of stuff. And of course, the cool thing with chinka pins is that they get a lot bigger than the typical bluegill. They do, uh, although in some of these swamps, as we've seen today, there's some giant bluegill. Yeah, I mean, Jaffly Basin's got some really giant bluegill in certain areas. But yeah, the chinka pin are generally, you know, can be anywhere from, you know, a big chinka pin is one that you can't get your hand around. In general, those fish are a few ounces to maybe even half a pound bigger than your bigger bluegill. And as far as eating, all of these panfish are just absolutely phenomenal. Absolutely right? delicious. All right, so C-Mac, the fishing in this area, in this Maripaw Swamp, actually not so bad, but you feel like it could be a whole lot better. Is that correct? Yeah, I think it could be better. We had a great day today. I mean, this place is still pretty well known for catfish. You know, there's still a lot of panfish, as we found out today. We caught goggle eye and brim and chinkapin and just had a great old time. It's a perfect time of year for it. It's April. You know, those fish want to bite. They're bedding up. But... You know, this is another area, this is another one of those swamps similar to Desalmonds that at one time had a connection to the Mississippi River through the Blind River and through some other areas further to our west, and that connection has been cut off. And in the process over the last century, since the levees were put up and, and that connection from Blind River into this area has been cut off, you've seen kind of a slow decline in not only the water quality, but also just the overall health of this swamp. And so that's one of the reasons why a project that's been in the works for almost two decades now or more through the Coastal Protection Restoration Authority in, in Louisiana, and even before the CPRA existed, there was talk about reconnecting this area to the Mississippi River to get some water flow, a little bit of fine sediment moving back in here to improve the water quality and to try to keep the swamp alive as long as possible. I mean, this is such a beautiful place. As the crow flies, where I grew up duck hunting is only about eight or 10 miles away from here. And man, it was just such an incredible place to hunt in that McElroy Swamp, Moorpaw Swamp area. You know, one of the first Duck Commander videos ever shot was in this swamp. Uh, Phil Robertson and Warren Coco and folks that everybody knows, just such ubiquitous names in hunting and fishing in Louisiana. They came in here and, and, and killed mallards and gray ducks and wood ducks and and had a great hunt. But in the time since that video was, was made 30 years ago, this habitat has really declined. It, it's just not a place that supports ducks like it used to. Uh, and it's not a fantastic fishery, unfortunately. And that's really a shame because look at the proximity that we are to say New Orleans and the North Shore and the Baton Rouge. There's a lot of recreational boating that goes on here. There's a lot of guys who take Blind River, you know, out to Lake Maurepaw and have a great time with the family, and that's great, but it's not a fantastic fishery, and it could be a little bit better if we made those connections back to the Mississippi River. It's also really a unique habitat in that, you know, you've got rivers that originate up in Mississippi, you know, the Amy and other rivers that, that dump into this basin. And you've also got the Mississippi River. So it's one of those areas where you're getting influence from different river systems and it makes for a unique habitat. You see a lot of these native vegetation in here, but unfortunately what you also see is a lot of this invasive stuff. Right, look at all of the salvinia that's, that's bunched up in here. And one of the ideas behind the relatively small diversion that's being designed and on its way to construction to reconnect the Mississippi River to here is to get water flowing through some of these backwater swamps and some of these canals, maybe cut down some of these spoil banks and shove this invasive grass out of here. You know, just get the water moving enough to where you don't have so many areas that are congested and clogged and eventually lose dissolved oxygen because you've got so much invasive vegetation in here. So there's a lot of potential for this area. This is such a culturally important place for the river parishes, for folks from St. James Parish and Ascension Parish, St. John Parish. So many families that grew up having a connection to this, this Blind River area, this Moorpaw Swamp area. And they have noted, uh, you know, that over the last 50 years or so, the amount of habitat decline that they've seen. Subsidence is easy to see in coastal marshes. You know, they sink and, and one day they're there and the next year they're not. Here it's a little bit more difficult to see, but this area is undergoing some subsidence as well. There are high ridges in here that used to have palmettos on it where guys would deer hunt. Now those areas are underwater. And that constant inundation because this area is sinking 
has really jeopardized the health of the cypress swamp and the Tupelo gums and the other things that grew up in here. So getting some water moving through a small scale project at first, 5,000 cubic feet per second at Garyville off the river into this swamp is going to do some short term benefit, some long term benefit. But really the idea here is perhaps to open up a larger diversion sometime in the future that would alleviate some of the pressure off the Bonnie Carey spillway, but move more water through this swamp where it can be a lot more beneficial. We have had to use the Bonnie Carey a lot more in the last 15 years than historically it was ever used before. And if you did have the opportunity to move 15 or 20 or 25, 30,000 CFS through here and maybe through the swamp at Dissolvance by reconnecting the river there, it would reduce the frequency of and, and the length of the use of Bonnie Carey and how much volume would have to come through Bonnie Carey into Lake Pontchartrain. And it would have a lot more benefit for this swamp to move that water through it than to move it into Lake Pontchartrain. Moving that water through a swamp gives it so much more opportunity to be, for the nutrients to be absorbed, the sediments to fall out, all the benefits of that Mississippi River, that high oxygen water. This swamp can utilize that a lot more than Lake Pontchartrain. It's not a long-term, extremely negative thing to open the body carry into, the, in, into Lake Pontchartrain as long as you don't have to do it every year, every other year, every three years. Then it starts to become a problem. Then you start to get your algae blooms and you start to get that nutrient loading. If you would move it through these swamps and let these cypress trees and this vegetation absorb it, then you could take some of that nutrient out before it gets into your open water lake.